We are in the fifth week. This is the second last week of our series, Ask It. And uh, we've been talking about this one question, and it is based on this, this book by Andy Stanley called Ask It. And we want to give two books away today, all right? So if you're feeling lucky, do you feel lucky, punk? If you feel lucky, this could be your week, all right? Now, anyone whose birthday was last week, um, would you raise your hand? Who has a birthday last week? You? Was it Adele? Would you come forward? I want to give you this book as a gift. All right. How about that? You better read it. <laughs> All right. Anybody else whose birthday was last week? Sarah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you... Anthony. Okay, come forward, Anthony. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Anthony is our faithful uh, sound person. So if you can hear me well through the microphone, that's because of Anthony and his team uh, who are very, very faithful. They're all very faithful in serving God. Well, throughout this series, we've been asking this one simple question and I want us to say it out loud before we say it up on the screen to see if you remember because this is our uh, fifth week already. The question that we've been asking for the last few weeks is, what, what is the wise thing for me to do? Okay, that's pretty lame. Okay, let's have it up here. I want us to say it out loud together on the count of three. One, two, three. What's the wise thing for me to do? And um, we kind of flesh this out so that we really get the full meaning of this question, make it a bit more three-dimensional, and we ask it this way, in light of my past experience, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for me to do? What's the wise thing for me? Not for you, because your past is not my past. My current circumstances may be different to yours, and I have different future hopes and dreams than you. So I need to make a different kind of decision probably from you because what is wise for you may not be wise for me. And this is such a powerful question that will save you a lot of heartache, a lot of tears, because this question takes us beyond the simple right or wrong. Last week we talked about it, isn't it? A lot of Christians, they were trapped by this right or wrong question. It's not wrong for you to have lunch with your colleague. It's not wrong for you to drop by. It's not wrong for you to buy that car. But that's not the question, is it? It's not, is it right or wrong? But is it the wise thing for you to do? Uh, and it takes us beyond what is legal and what's illegal. It takes us beyond what you can afford, what you cannot afford. Because the best question that you could ever ask yourself before you make an important decision is to ask, is it wise? What is the wise thing for me to do? And this question, will you will let God help you by asking this question to get the, the most out of life because God has a wonderful plan for all of your lives. And a lot of times we jeopardize, you know, we shortcut God's plan for our life because we are not wise in the way that we make decisions. Now, today, I want to talk about something that's really, really important. All of us have regrets in our life. And I was... I'm uh, going like, to ask you to spend two minutes to share with the person sitting next to you your deepest regret, but I know it's going to be silent, so probably not a good idea. But all of us have regrets in our life, don't we? And if we have a time machine, if we could turn back time, we wish we could erase that weekend. We wish we could erase that decision. We wish we could turn back on that summer, and we unfortunately cannot do that. So instead, we simply just say things like, Man, how could I be so dumb, right? How could I be so stupid? And you say things like, I should have seen it coming. I should have seen it coming. I want to talk about this for a few seconds. Now, if you say, I should have seen it coming, chances are there was someone in your life who actually did see it coming. My mom warned me about him, but... I didn't pay attention to her. I didn't see it coming. The signs were all there. My dad told me this and this was going to happen. I should have seen that coming. So 
In other words, that terrible decision that you made in the past, that bad relationship, that unwise spending that you made, and you look back in the, you know, to those times and you said, I should have seen it coming. Let me tell you, chances are there was someone in your life at the time who actually did see it coming, but either A, you didn't listen, or B, they didn't tell you. And the reason why no one told you is probably because they thought, even if I tell him, even if I tell her, she wouldn't, what? Listen, that's right. That's the reason why probably someone didn't tell you. Let me guarantee you, if you look back on your life and you think, I should have seen it coming, most probably someone did see it coming, but you didn't listen or someone didn't tell you. So here's the question that is very important that's going to drive the rest of this message. And the question is this, why is it that I can't see it coming, but somebody else can, right? Or let me turn it the other way. Why can you see, you know, why can I see problem coming into your life, but you can't see it? Why can you see problem coming my way, but I can't see it? Why is it that I know exactly what you need to do, but you don't. And you know exactly what I need to do, but I don't do it. You see, this is a very important question, isn't it? Because you and I, we are alike. You know, we don't want to waste another season of our life. And then looking back at this season of our life, and we said, man, you know, that was just a bad, bad thing. I should have seen that coming. I don't want you to look back on your life, on another busted relationship, Another bad financial decision, another bad, you know, uh, moral decision and all that because you actually should have seen that coming. Now, here's why, or here's part of the reason why, all right? You didn't see it coming uh, because as much as you like to say that I should have seen that coming, how could I be so stupid? Actually, for some stuff, there's no way in the world that you could have seen that coming. There's no way in the world. That's why no matter how many times you say it, when you look back and you have that regret, and you said, I should have seen that coming, most probably, actually, there's no way in the world you could have seen that coming. Let me tell you why. The reason is because just about every important, just about every big decision is emotionally charged, and emotionally charged environments are not ideal for decision making. When you think back over some of the most important decisions that you have made in the past, isn't it true those decisions were emotionally charged? That's why people say you don't shop in the supermarket when you are hungry because you would be shopping for stuff that you don't normally shop because your tummy is doing the shopping, correct? You don't make decisions when you are emotionally charged. That's why a lot of people... They make a lot of bad financial decisions. Why? Because financial decisions, a lot of them are emotionally charged. A lot of young couples, they buy a house, for example, that is beyond their budget. The house that is way too expensive for the area. Why? Because you go to the open house, you know, there's this open house, and you go, oh, I love the house. We got to have this house, right? You, ha you cannot have seen it coming because when you make that decision, you are so emotionally charged. Somebody else could see it coming, but there's no way in the world that you could, right? So what happens is your emotions make what's obvious less obvious. So when it's you, the emotion just overtook you, right? When you make those decisions. But for me, I'm fine. I can see clearly, like the song, you know, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. That's right. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? That's the lyric of the song. It's very, very powerful. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. You are in the midst of the storm. You can't see clearly. Oh, he's so cute. You can't see clearly, right? You've already fallen in love with the guy. You know, you can't, I can see all obstacles in my way. But you can't because you are in the midst of this uh, emotional storm there's no way in the world that you'll be able to see all the obstacles in your way. You're just surrounded 
by these obstacles you could not see. That's why we, you will have a conversation that goes something like this with your friends. You don't see it? I said, no. What, what do you see in him? You don't see it. Everybody else around you see it except for you, correct? You cannot see all the obstacles. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. All those emotions are dark clouds for you, and you are blinded by those emotional uh, stuff that is all going on inside your heart. That's why, that's why I'm telling you, I can do a much better job managing your money than you. Because, you know, I will not make impulse decision with your money. Because it is not my money, right? So if you want to make wise financial decision, trust your money to me. And when you want to buy something, you ask me, hey, Daniel, can I buy that thing? And I said, okay, based from your past history, all these bad purchases you make, and that, oh, it's going to break down, it's going to lose value in a couple of months. No. But I really, really want it. No. Right? Because I'm free from all those emotions that is associated with your money. But you're not. You're stuck with all those feelings. I got to have this. I got to have this. That's why I don't take Jaden to Kmart too often. Because Kmart people, they're smart. You know, all those toys, guess where they put them? Not on the upper shelves. They put all those toys in the, in the lower shelves. Even though I already made Jaden promise. Jaden promise, we're going to go to Kmart to get something for mommy. We're not buying new toys, all right? Promise, daddy. Promise. But once... He got hold of that toy. Suddenly, the emotion is taking over, correct? Dad, I gotta have this. I gotta have this. That's why I'm a better financial manager for Jaden's money than Jaden. You see? Uh, that's why in marriage, it's the same thing, right? If you could sit with me through marriage counseling, you know, you have this husband and wife. Even if you're single, let me tell you, even if you're single, you could sit with me and you would know exactly what to do with that couple, right? And the husband would say, this, 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 and the wife would say, this, 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 and you know immediately what to do, right? How to solve that marriage problem, even if you're single. Why? Because it's obvious to you. You just have to stop doing that, and you stop saying that, okay? That's the solution. Why is it? I can fix your marriage problem in two minutes, but I have years and years of marriage problem with my own wife, and I can't fix it. Why? Because marriage is an emotional thing. Same thing with raising your kids. Don't you know exactly what to do with the neighbor's kids? <laughs> right? <laughs> Man, you know, Mike, if Ben were my son, I'm going to have him do one, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to let him do one, two, three, four, five. I know exactly what to do with Ben, right? Even if you're single, you know, you look at all some of these parents and say, oh man, these are bad parents. I would know exactly what to do if I were the parents of that child. But then again, you know, uh, I've had Jaden for nine years now. Until today, Hulda and I are in this cloud. <laughs> we can't make wise decisions. So, um, what do we do, right? What do we do? What's the wise thing to do? Back to our question. Uh, when you are emotionally charged and you need to make a decision, what is the wise thing for you to do? I must have that house. I really, really like her. But then again, you know, based on your past experience, that you need to make wise decision, that you want to live with fewer regrets in your life, fewer tears. Uh, you don't want to waste any more money than necessary. Right? What do you do? The answer is simple. One word. You have to listen. Everyone say listen. You have to listen. Because you don't see it coming, but I guarantee you, somebody else in your life will have seen it coming. So next time, you want to make a decision, and you say to yourself, uh oh, this is an emotional decision, I better call Rico. Uh oh, this is an emotional decision, I'm, I'm being angry right now, I better call Pastor Michael. Oh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm lonely, I'm lonely, and I, I could have done this. Oh, before you make those decisions... Knowing that you are emotionally charged, you better listen to someone else in your life. Now, you don't have to believe me for it. Uh, in the Bible, there's this guy. 
He's the wisest man that has ever lived. And that would, be, that would be an understatement. Probably wiser than anybody else except for Jesus, probably. I would say Jesus would be wiser than him. But this person is so wise. His name is King Solomon. And you can read the story about him in the book of 1 Kings. And in the book of 1 Kings, he was described like this. I'm going to read it for us. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight. So he didn't learn it like the rest of us. God gave it to him. That's unfair, isn't it? Like God gave Pastor Mike a great voice. God gave Jibo the ability to be funny, you know. God gave you the ability to solve math problem. Uh, some of you are handsome, you know. Uh, like that, right? Just, it's God. So... <laughs> Solomon was 17 years old. He was uh, about to lead a nation. He said, God, I don't know what to do. What do you want? God, said, God says, what do you want? Solomon, let me think. PlayStation? No, I want wisdom. And just, God just gave it to him. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight. And a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. From all nations, people come to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. So what happened was he is so wise, kings from all over the world, actually before they're about to make important decisions, they actually send people to come and be in Solomon's presence. Sometimes they have to line up for weeks, for days, before they get to be in the presence of Solomon. And that too for only a few minutes. And they, they bring gold and silver to present to King Solomon for a piece of advice that is very sound, very wise. All these kings and queens send their people to seek wisdom from Solomon. He's, he is that wise. Now, here's the good news. The good news is you don't have to stand in line for weeks or days, to hear Solomon's wisdom. Because Solomon wrote most of his wisdom in the book called Proverbs. Actually, he wrote a few different books, Song of Solomon and also uh, Ecclesiastes, right? But in this one particular book called the book of Proverbs, there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. If you want wisdom, let me tell you, just read one chapter of Proverbs a day so you can go through the whole Proverbs in one month uh, and you will be wise. So Solomon, the wisest person that has ever lived, he gave this awesome piece of advice, more so than any other ancient writers, any other biblical writers. He said, if you want to be wise, you need to ask. You need to seek counsel. That's his advice. Come on, you know. Of all the people in the world, he's the person who needs advice from other people the least. Because he's the wisest man that has ever lived, right? And yet, his advice to you, to me, is you got to seek counsel. You better seek counsel. I'm going to read a few. If you don't believe me, I'm going to read a few of what he wrote here, all right? Proverbs 9, verse 9 says it this way. Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. When you instruct, advise the wise, they will listen to you. That's why the wise is going to be even wiser, because they listen to advice. Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. Proverbs 12, verse 15, the way of fools seems right to them. That's why we don't want to talk to these people. Say, ah, he knows everything. She knows everything. She wouldn't listen to you. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise, what? Listen. To advice. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advices, they succeed. See, all these proverbs, they say the same thing. And the last one especially, 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. I mean, this comes from the mouth of Solomon. Like, if you are a genius, you give advice to people who seek advice from you, you say, you got to go to school. And you say, but you don't even go to school. You're a genius. But this genius tells you, you better go to school, right? Or if you're naturally talented in music, 
This person says to you, you better go to music school. You better practice. But you don't practice. You're a musical genius. That's exactly what happened. Solomon, the wisest king who has ever lived, who doesn't need advice from anybody, he says, with many advices, you will succeed. A couple more. Proverbs 19.20. Listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. Remember our question, in light of your future hopes and dreams, what you want to have relationally, financially in the future, spiritually, what is the wise thing for you to do? Solomon says, well, you know, you got to listen to advice, then you will be counted among the wise. When you look back on your life, people will say about you, wow, so-and-so is very wise. She is very wise. Last verse, Proverbs 13, verse 10. Where there is strife, there is pride. Where there is strife, there is pride. This is a relational wisdom. Solomon says, whenever you have fighting among you, father, son, husband, wife, boss, subordinates, usually the root cause of that is pride because you don't listen. Husband doesn't listen to the wife. Wife doesn't listen to the husband. Parents doesn't listen to the kid. Kid doesn't listen to the parents. Boss doesn't listen to the staff. Staff doesn't listen to the boss. And then he said this, but wisdom is found in those who take advice, right? Now, here's the strange thing. Solomon, who gave you all this wonderful advice, you know, he started his life really, really well, but at the end, he kind of like ruined his own life because he didn't listen to his own advice. You know, after a while, he thought, I'm the wisest person who's ever lived. I don't need counsel from anybody. So he ruined not only his life, but practically the whole nation of Israel toward the end of his life for his stupid, stupid decision, which is very ironic because one of the wisest men who's ever lived made some of the dumbest decisions that was ever made in the world. He wrecked the economy of Israel. He wrecked his own family. You know, he just wrecked everything. Now, so far, you haven't heard anything that's new, right? So far, this is like common knowledge. You know this. If you're a teenager, you say, oh, man, my parents have been telling me this all along. Uh, if you are a trainer, you know, you're, a, you're an advisor, you said, yeah, I'm going to take this down. Uh, I'm going to teach it to my client, right? This is nothing new. We all know this. But the question is this. Why don't we do it? We know It is better for us to listen to wise counsel than not. But why is it that very few of you, including me, very few of us, we're actually looking and searching and seeking wise counsel in our life? That is the question. Now, I want to spend the rest of the uh, few minutes that I have to try to answer this question. Why don't we listen to wise counsel? Why don't we listen to the advice of others, all right? Number one is this, because we already know what the wise people are going to say, and we just don't want to hear it, yeah? We already know, like a lot of us, actually, it's not like we don't know. We know if we talk to someone, if I talk to Pastor Daniel, this is exactly what he's going to say, and you're probably right. That's why you don't come to me and seek advice, because you you already know what I was going to say, and you don't want to do anything different. You're too afraid to change your lifestyle. You're too afraid to change your behavior. So that's why, you know, you don't want to listen to others. This is exactly what Solomon said. Remember in week two, we said, if you know what is the right thing to do, the right thing to do is to listen, but you don't do it, what does Solomon call you? You are a, a fool, a fool. A fool is someone who knows the right thing to do, but he or she just doesn't do it. Okay? Now, if you are one of those people, next time, okay, uh, if you're a Christian, you know how in the past, like in the, in the 80s, was it in the 80s, people like to wear this bracelet called WWJD? Yeah, what would Jesus do? Uh, that's like to stop people in their track and remind them before they do something, stop and ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Now, you don't even have to go that far, all right? Just ask, what would my mama do? Just ask that. Huh? WWMWD. 
something. You know, the acronym is not good. But <laughs> because your mom will know exactly what to do in those different situations, usually. Or WW, what would my wife do? Right? If you don't want to listen from God, if you don't want to listen from Jesus, at least listen. What would my best friend do in this situation? Okay? So that's number one. Number two, the reason why we don't listen is this, and this is very powerful. It's because we think it's none of their business, right? This is my life. This is my money. This is my family. This is none of your business. I make this private decision on my own. Uh, it's going to affect me. And, you know, thank you very much. Thank you for sending me those emails. Thank you for reminding me about this and that. Don't worry about it. Just pray for me. All right? That's it. Just leave it at that because it is my private decision. But some, there's something you got to know about what you call private decisions. All those private decisions, more likely than not, they will have public consequences. Private decisions, more often than not, result in public consequences. If you don't believe me, every time you read scandals on newspapers or you watch this you know, uh, TV show, this politician, this, this celebrity, you know, all these different scandals, they're exposed for everybody to know. You know how they all began? They all began the same way with private decision. Do you know that when you make foolish decision, more often than not, it's not just going to affect you, it's going to affect your wife, it's going to affect your husband, it's going to affect your children, it's going to affect your uh, co-workers in the office, it's going to affect a lot of people. So don't just think, this is just me, it's my own business, it's my money, I can do whatever I want with my money, I can teach my kid however I want because I'm the parent. Well, probably you have to rethink that a little bit more. Because every private decision that you make, they will have pub public consequences, right? That's why people sometimes say, I don't need to be told what to do. I'm an adult. I'm 17 years old. I have a lot of experience in my life. I know exactly what to do. Well, you know, we all think that, right? <laughs> I'm not knocking on 17 years old or anything like that. When you are 21, it's the same thing. When you're 31, you're going to look back on the 21 years old and say, oh, man, if I only know now, if I knew then what I know now, you know, if you're 41, you're going to look back on the 31 years old and exactly the same thing. So, um, last two reasons. Let's talk about these last two reasons. And these last two reasons is, uh, have one common, common denominator. That one common de denominator is pride. The third reason why we don't seek advice, why we don't listen, is this. Because success is intoxicating, and we think we know everything. Success is very intoxicating, and we think we know everything. All of us will experience some kind of success in one area of life or another. Some of you are successful businessmen, and because you are a successful businessman, you think you know everything. You think you know everything there is to know about church life. You think you know everything there is to know about family. You think you know everything there is to know about anything. Why? Because you are successful in one area, you think you know everything about other areas as well. It's very intoxicating. You know, if you're the richest man in the room, everybody will listen to you. Suddenly, you will sound wiser than you really are, right? If you are powerful, if you are successful, you walk into the room, you're like the prettiest girl in that room, everybody will look to you, everybody will laugh very loudly at your half funny jokes, right? You are more handsome than you actually are when you are rich. You, that's the truth. It's just a fact of life, correct? Now, and it's very intoxicating because people listen to you. People laugh at your jokes. People ask for advice from you. And because of that, you think you know everything. I don't need advice from my pastor. I don't need advice from my wife. I'm a successful businessman, yeah? So it's very, very difficult to stay humble when you are successful. And this is the downfall of many pastors as well. You know, just because you can build a large church, you think, man, I'm above reproach. No one can tell me what to do anymore. You know, uh, or, or same thing. If you've been a Christian for a long time, maybe you think you are more spiritual 
than everybody else. And now people can't tell you what to do anymore. You don't want to listen to sermon anymore. You don't want to do anything because you're, oh man, that's just rubbish. You know, this is, why? Because it is tough to be successful at one thing. It is very, very intoxicating. It's like a drug, right? And it makes you think that you know everything because of it. And um, so you ask questions, something like this, you know. Why would I seek advice from you about parenting? You know, I'm a parent. Uh, why would I seek advice from you about children? I used to be a child. I know exactly what to do, you know. I used to have surgery. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? You know, just because you used to have surgery, that means you know everything there is to know about surgery. So it doesn't work that way. You got to realize when you are powerful, when you are successful in one area, just because you are successful in one area doesn't mean you know everything there is to know about everything. All right? That's number three. And lastly, number four, the reason why we don't listen is because it's the opposite. When if success is intoxicating, failure is humiliating. Failure is humiliating. This is the reason why you don't want to listen to others, which is kind of weird. I, I want to tell all the women here uh, before we close some strange truth about us men. All right? This is very, very strange, but, you know, it's, it's the truth. I, I swear to God, it's the truth. Uh, it's probably true for you as well, but I don't know you. I'm not a woman, so I don't know. I can tell you this is true for men, right? For men, it's funny. When you are good with something, you don't mind receiving advice in the area that you are good at. For example, let's say you're good with marketing, right? You would go to more marketing courses. You would buy more books on marketing. You would upskill yourself in the area that you're already good at. There's no problem for you. But in the area that you're not so good at, and people try to correct you in that area, suddenly you say, oh, no, right? Your wife recognizes, oh, my husband needs help. So your wife would buy a book in the one area that you're struggling with, maybe how to be a dad or something. And not only that, but your wife highlights some paragraphs, some pages for you. Look. Hubby, you don't need to read the whole book. I already highlighted the important part for you. <laughs> what do you do? You got angry with your wife. What are you talking about? I know exactly how to be a dad. See, in the area that you're not so good at, you're very touchy, you're very sensitive. You know why? That's a simple explanation to that. Because failure is humiliating to men. That's why husbands usually don't listen to the advice of the wife. Do you really need to start that new business? Do you really need to go out of town again for your company? You know, we don't listen to the advice of others, especially in the area that we're not so good at because it is humiliating to us. So, uh, God says this. I don't design you that way. I designed you to live in the community. That's why in this church, we always encourage you, you know, to join Link, to join small group, so that you can be who you are in that community and, and people can speak into your life and you can speak into people's life. Because I tell you, I'm telling you, you know, there will be times when you need to make some very important decisions and you are so emotionally charged over those decisions, you can't make a sound, a wise judgment. That's when you need your fellow Christian. That's when you need your pastor. That's when you need your business advisor. That's when you need your wife. That's when you need your husband to speak the truth into your life. So the conclusion is this. Here's the conclusion. Somebody can see what you can't see. Question is, are you going to invite them in? Not only that, but somebody can see what you're pretending not to see. Because sometimes, it's not that we can't see, but we're pretending not to see. Are you willing to invite them in? That's the question, right? Next statement. Wise people know what they don't know, and they are not afraid, they're not intimidated, they're not ashamed, to, or too pride, they're not too prideful to ask those who actually do know. Wise people know what they don't know, and they're not afraid to ask those who do know. And finally, this is the question that we've been asking for the last few weeks. In light 
of my past experience, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for me to do? Let me tell you what's the wise thing for you to do. The wise thing for you to do is to listen to others. Very simple truth. The wise thing for you to do, if you care about your future, relationally, spiritually, financially, morally, the wise thing for you to do before you make that phone call, before you sign on that dotted line, before you respond to that SMS you shouldn't have responded, call someone, tell your wife about it, talk to your husband about it, because maybe that's one of the times when you are so clouded in your judgment that you will not make a wise decision. And if you do make that decision, looking back, you will say to yourself, I should have seen that coming but there's no way in the world that you could because you were so clouded with your emotion let me pray for you don't miss next week as we conclude this series and we're gonna get to the bottom of this question what is the wise thing for me to do uh, and i hope again this is not just another message or message series for you but i really do hope and pray that you will apply this to your life and, and make the most out of the life that God has gifted you with. Let's bow our head. Before we pray, uh, I just want to say that just, just like our emotion often cloud our judgment, do you know, especially if you're visiting with us, do you know that our sin cloud our view of God? We judge God based on how we feel about Him. We think he's an angry God, cruel. And then Jesus came along and Jesus said, I can see clearly who God is because I'm not clouded by sin like you. In fact, I came to die for your sin so that you can see clearly who your Heavenly Father is. The Heavenly Father who loves you unconditionally no matter what you've done. The Father who is more gracious to you than you could ever imagine, whose arms are stretched wide and just couldn't wait to welcome you home. So this evening, before we close in prayer, I just want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, maybe you heard about Him, but you know He died on the cross and all that, but you don't understand what it means. Let me tell you what it means. Jesus died on that cross to pay for our sins. The broken relationship that we have with our Creator God because of sins, at that very moment when Jesus died, He bridged that gap. He forgives all of our sins, the Bible says. All you need to do is to trust Him and just to believe Him. And Jesus says, I will give you eternal life. You will spend eternity with your Creator God. Not because you're good, not because you're perfect. Because I have been perfect for you. I died on this cross to pay for what you could not pay on your own. And that's my gift to you. That's why it's called grace. We don't deserve it, but God is so gracious. He just sent His one and only Son to do that for us, to die for us on our behalf at the cross. So before we close in prayer, I just want to pray for you. And if you say, Daniel, include me in that prayer. I, I, I want my sins forgiven. I, I, I want my broken relationship with my Heavenly Father to be restored. I don't know everything there is to know about Christianity and all that. But I really want, I really desire a relationship with my Creator. If that's your desire, that's also God's desire for you. Do you know that? And God has been waiting for this moment for you to come home and for you to accept that free gift of salvation. It's just to simply say to God, God, I trust you. I'm not perfect. I just want to trust you for it. So I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And if that's you, 
I just want you to say after me these words. These are not magical words. But God sees what is inside your heart. All right? So if this is you, I want you to say it out loud with me. If you're a Christian, I want you to say it out loud as well as we support our new brothers and sisters in Christ. So say it after me. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the free gift of salvation. I don't deserve it. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Thank you for forgiving me. Now I'm clean, totally forgiven. Not because of what I've done, but because of what you've done. Now I receive the free gift of eternal life. No one can take that away from me. You are faithful. I will not be shaken. I will spend eternity with you forever and ever. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. For those of you who pray for that prayer for the first time, do you know that the angels are rejoicing right now? In fact, why don't we just give a huge round of applause for those who make those decisions. Good on you. If you pray that prayer for the first time, I want to know about it. Uh, after this, uh, you can tell me, say, hey, Pastor Daniel, I prayed that prayer for the first time. Thank you. know, uh, What do I do now? I can, I can lead you, give you advice, what you can do next as you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand on your feet right now? It is the custom in our church to be dismissed and to receive God's blessing. So let's receive God's blessing together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always, wherever you go. May God grant you wisdom. May God cause you to stop and ask and listen, not only to Him, but also to the people around you. Because God has put those people around you for a reason. It is not an accident that you have your wife, that you have your husband. It is not an accident that you have people around you who love you. God speaks through those people. And may God the Holy Spirit anoint you, indwell you, so that whatever you do, you will always bring glory to God's name. Now, until Jesus Christ comes again, even forevermore. And all God's people who are blessed, say it together with me, Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody.